Everybody, if you have a question, please use one of the microphones so the people on the far side can hear you. Do not turn the microphones off. There's about five or six microphones out in the wild, so we should be able to have one close by. Okay, so you can get there's another one up here as well. Good morning. Well, I have not. I really was trying to Well, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Lee. I'm the Chief HR Officer for the VCCS, and here with my colleague, Karen Foreman. She's the Chief HR Officer for uh, Lord Fairfax uh, uh, Community College. So it is our pleasure to share a few things that are going on in the, uh, within the system, and particularly uh, in the HR function, as we do a variety of things uh, in support of all of us in the room and how to make uh, the VCCS a, a much more, uh, much better place to work and a, a much more productive uh, sort of working environment. So today is all about you and I and what we do together to make the VCCS really a special place, and I, I really think it is a special place. So we're going to talk about some of these things as we go. So today is really uh, uh, designed, as the slide said here, to improve the quality of the student experience by empowering faculty and staff 
to do you know bigger and better things. So we're going to talk about some of that support structure that allows that to happen. We're also going to ask you to engage with us over time to uh, do that in a much better way. And then there's a, you know a quick commercial for the second uh, second hour. Uh, my colleague Susan Grinnan, uh, who's a uh, HR officer for uh, John Tyler Community College, she and I are talking about adjuncts. So all of these things work together, and what we're we're going to talk about being a more or less an HR strategy. So it's about human capital strategy, and we'll explain what that means. It's a nice little buzzword. We're going to talk about a compensation philosophy effort that we're that we're up to uh, as a system. We're going to talk about diversity and its place in what we're what we're up to. A chancellor's goal for this academic year. We have a task force doing that. We're talking about some performance management ideas and evaluations, and then what we're doing as an HR community and other very strategic initiatives uh, today. So we'll start with this idea that it's really all about student success. What can you and I do together to create an environment for students to graduate, matriculate, and uh, you know, go off and be successful? And of course, that happens through you know, our, our capable uh, faculty. So what, how do we empower faculty and deans, how do we create that engine to allow people to work better? So that's what it's about. The, the VCCS is a very large enterprise, I mean, a very complex organization. We have 800 uh, you know, administrative and professional faculty, about 1,200 workforce development folks working at any given time. You know, we have lots of student employees as well who uh, contribute to what we do every day. And we have 2,300, you know, more than 2,300 uh, full-time faculty, you know, uh, teaching our students. Then we have amazing classified staff, a big cadre of, of that group, lots of uh, part-time staff as well. And then we have, as you know, lots and lots of adjuncts as well. So we are a really big organization, nearly 23,000 strong, and the VCCS spends about $700 million a year on personnel services. So we're about a billion plus corporation. One of our board of directors, if you will, if you're talking about a corporation, is here with us this morning, uh, James Cuth Cuthbertson. He's on the State Board for Community Colleges. And we have a massive enterprise, and so the argument that we would make about that is, shouldn't we have a coherent plan to manage these resources, these talents, in a much more professional manner? And that's what this is about. So we're going to make an argument here, and this says that organizations that are good places to work, all the research is, you know, is emerging in this area, and it validates the idea that if you're talking about a for-profit sort of company, that uh, you know, those companies on their like Fortune 100 best places to work sort of list, that they outperform companies that are not significantly in many different ways. And some of these slides uh, foretell that. This is another example. You know, their, their stock market return is significant, right? It's not just a passing fad. The whole idea that when we're supported uh, better, uh, when we have the right kind of environment, we all perform much better, and we're aiming to do exactly that. So and then this slide here speaks to an HR perspective, and what it says is that, you know, organizations have a strategy, if you will, about how they go about doing business. You know, you link the stuff that happens in the HR domain, you know, to, to support people, right? You know, to hire them, train them, support them, compensate them, things like that. And all that comes together, and ideally, it creates better outcomes. Uh, the research shows things like if you're in a for-profit environment, increased customer satisfaction, you know, customer retention, higher profits, higher return on investments, you know, all the sort of positive indicators that you would expect. And we can certainly use that you know, same sort of parallel to make the argument that if we're supporting faculty better, if we're supporting deans better, uh, and people feel empowered and uh, appreciate their work environment, they'll perform better, and therefore students will you know, have higher satisfaction. You know, they, will, they will grow. Uh, they will uh, graduate and matriculate. So that's the idea. And so the buzzword is a human capital strategy. As we said, we invest $700 plus million a year into this enterprise. So what's our plan? How are we going to go about doing that? Utilize those resources in the best possible manner. That is the challenge we have before us. A couple of slides before, we talked about the human, you know, the uh, kind of that strategy sort of thing. Uh, and it said that organizations have a strategy. We have one. We talked about Achieve you know, 2015. and. We're already working on that next plan, and it's about access and success and things like that. A few years ago, you know, the reengineering group looked at a few things, and HR has taken some of that is uh, about investing in people. We'll talk about a couple things we're doing to do that. Uh, you know, uh, managing with productivity in mind, all those things that we can do together. As I said, 
to make us a better place to work. So here's what some of the research says about people who are happy at work, people who are empowered at work. You know, they call it engagement these days. And some people describe engagement as uh, discretionary effort, right? The whole idea that, you know, we all have mortgages, right? We all got obligations. You have to have a job. You know, you come to work, you work hard, you know, you're given, you know, pay. Uh, but beyond that, there's a whole lot more potential. And when you work with people the right way, they work harder. I mean, and I, don't, I can't think of anyone better to fit that model than faculty. People who don't come to work. I mean, people don't enter the, the teaching profession uh, thinking about a job. You know, it's like a calling, right? You know what I'm saying? It's like people believe in what they are doing and how it positively affects people's lives. And so this idea about engagement is around that, where those, those people who just simply will not let the students fail. Right? I mean, it's one thing just to lecture, but it's another thing to really care, right? to really invest in that. And that's what this is about. It's about engagement, people who really care about what they do and really take that to heart. As a matter of fact, kind of a segue about that that I think is really kind of poignant for me, when we started the whole faculty evaluations process about five years ago, we brought in the, um, the past kind of award-winning faculty. And it was the chancellor's uh, uh, award for teaching excellence recipients for the past, you know, like 25 years, and then the chef teaching, you know, uh, awardees, you know, for the past 25 years. We invited anybody we could find, and we had like three focus groups over that period of time as we said, what should good performance look like? And we asked them a lot of questions, such as, why did you enter the profession? What do you think it takes, or whatever? And it was kind of interesting, the results. The results, to me, said a couple things. One of it was most that they all had kind of a an inferiority complex. They all thought that they were not good teachers and they were striving to be better, right? You know, and I thought that was kind of interesting. The people who did the best were concerned most about not being able to affect others, and then they were all uniquely inspired by a previous teacher, right? Because they were telling stories of Miss Whomever from the third grade or Mr. Whomever. It was kind of very, very inspiring, but. My take on all that was essentially they just cared more, right? You know, they went to the same schools, they did the same kind of stuff, but they just tried more and they cared more. And I think that speaks to a lot about what we do for a living and the whole idea of engagement. All right, so one of the activities, as we said, we've got several things going on uh, related to this idea of how do we help people uh, become engaged in their work, right? To, to create that environment to allow people to thrive. And so my colleague here, uh, Ms. Foreman, is going to share uh, one of the task forces that we have going uh, called a Compensation Philosophy Task Force. Right. I think I've got to give you this. All right, we're, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to give you the microphone because we're broadcasting live, uh, live streaming to folks at home. So I think we have a worldwide audience of about 2 billion people, just to let you know <laughs> who are paying attention well, to what we're doing. Do the clicker? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. If not, we'll switch. Yes. We're on. Okay. Okay. The compensation philosophy uh, work group. Um, this is the list of the individuals that make up um, this committee. Um, as you can see, we have a, a pretty diverse group on here, which we should have uh, coming from the VCCS, as well as a number of the community colleges. Now, what you're seeing up here is a what to call a rewards of work model that was produced by the Siegel Group. Um, the Siegel Group, they actually conducted um, a national reward study on government employees in the United States. And what they found is that financial and non-financial elements that are noted up here on this model are important to all employees. But there are some things up here that some felt were more important and have them as a higher priority. However, all of them were essential elements of this re uh, rewards of work model. The study did confirm that um, employee motivation, attraction, and retention are the three areas that are extremely important, not only to the employee, but also to us as the employer. And I believe that we all would agree that um, we are seeing demographic shifts uh, in the labor market and also in our staffing. And in order for us to remain competitive, uh, we've got to come up with a rewards package that's going to drive 
the uh, critical organizational outcomes that we're looking for. That means attracting, hiring, and retaining these highly skilled employees, um, providing job satisfaction for them, and having a plan in place that is going to meet the needs that we see up here. Now, one of the initiatives that um, Lord Fairfax Community College has done over the last two years, we have actually attained the um, Chronicles, uh, Chronicle of Higher Education Great College to work for. And we're actually working on year number three right now. Um, as a result of that, we actually can use that as part of our branding. And it's on our letterhead, it's on our envelopes, it's on a lot of our publications. Um, again, it's an initiative that when someone who's looking to come to work for Lord Fairfax Community College, they're seeing this listed in our ads online. Um, it means a lot. I mean, it, it speaks for itself. And so, you know, this is something that, you know, I would hope that all of our colleges could work towards um, to be considered a great college to work for. So what is a compensation philosophy? It's a formal statement that basically, or simply rather, uh, states what's behind employee pay and it creates a framework for consistency uh, when working with a compensation philosophy. Um, it establishes a set of guiding principles that drive our, our decision making and that's very important. How do we make those decisions on compensation? Um, spells out why certain choices are selected. Okay, and then I think the last statement, as I had mentioned before, consistency and fairness in how we, how we uh, handle our compensation activities is very important. So what does a compensation philosophy do? Again, you heard me say, recruit, retain, motivate. All right, those three things of our workforce are extremely important to us. I think some of the things that are really important up here uh, to point out to you is uh, the bullet number three, uh, defining how the mixture of our base pay, our incentive pay, and our benefits are used. All right, all three of those are important in a compensation package. Uh, competitive positioning, you know as well as I do that with the state, you know, it's it's hard to compete um, with private industry. So what kind of a rewards program can we have in place that's going to help us in those areas that's going to help to bring employees into the state. Um, the last one, providing an effective basis for legal defense of compensation decisions, that's also critical. Very important. It provides justification for why we make the decisions that we make. Okay, this looks difficult up there, doesn't it? <laughs> it's not as bad as it is. Okay, over on the left, you've got a business objective. And then with that business objective, you have a desired behavior outcome as a result of that objective. And then your pay program options. What are the things that we could put in place that will give us that or, or lend us that objective as well as the behavior that goes along with it? Now, the short-term incentives, as an example, bonuses. Okay. We've always had the option of bonuses, all right? But are we utilizing that part of the program, the compensation program, well enough? All right, some people get bonuses, not all people get bonuses. How do you determine who gets the bonuses? So we need to do a better job around the bonus uh, side. The, um, the um, low employee, employee turnover, that's retention. Okay, we want to be able to retain our high-performing employees. Now, we don't have the stock, uh, the stock option plans up there, certainly, but um, it, it does allow us to come up with different incentives. We have to be creative. Um, integrated processes, the teamwork, um, I think that one kind of speaks for itself and how, you know, how do we reward teams. The um, payroll cost control, do we have any classified staff in here today? Okay. All right. So broadbanding, you know what I'm talking about when we're talking about broadbanding. doesn't apply to the faculty or administrators. It applies to the classified staff. And so basically what we've done uh, or what the VCCS has done, um, 
is take a, a, a number of pay grades. What they do is in, instead of each individual position being classified all by itself, you take a, a group of positions and you place them into pay similar or into same pay grades and salary ranges and you group them. Um, it allows you to um, cluster the jobs or the tiers of the positions into uh, wide bands and it helps to manage growth and to deliver pay. Um, I've worked with broadbanding uh, only since I came to work for the state. It's been very interesting, but it works. Okay. And it cuts down on the number of um, salary grades that you have, um, and, and it clusters the positions into similar, um, similar pay grades. Highly trained workforce, the very last one. Um, you know, as our employees, they gain uh, the KSAs, which is knowledge, skills, and abilities, um, obtaining higher degrees. Okay, we have people always going back to school. Are we recognizing their achievements? Okay. Um, if we're not, then are we sending a message that we really are valuing our employees and the fact that they are willing to go back and um, obtain certificates or degrees? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> that's a very good question. Uh, but 30 years ago, you know, 30 years ago, I wasn't with the VCCS, so I don't know. No, I'm just joking. Uh, now, I think uh, the reason we're looking at the compensation philosophy is for that purpose. Uh, the reason we're doing the compensation philosophy is for the exact purpose. For us to clarify what and why uh, we do, you know, because we have some variability across colleges. What is our approach? What is our belief system? And then let's create a plan that supports that belief system. So as you said, it was time and grade. Is that what we want? Do we want to say you get paid more simply for the amount of seat time? Or do we want to say you get made, uh, paid more by your performance? Or how much you learn? Or how much you impact you know, student outcomes? Or whatever the issues are, it doesn't matter. We just need to agree upon those and then build a system around that so that we encourage people to do the things that the organization wants. So, the, you know, and that changes. So, uh, another idea is that our salaries in the past have been based upon uh, our appropriations, right? So, if the appropriations went up 2%, people got a 2% increase. Is that the only decision we make? But if, as we've seen in the past years, we haven't gotten increases and we've been stagnant. So I think we have to have a way of balancing out our decision making over time and to do things that make sense. It's like the bonuses kind of thing. Does that make sense to award people for short term or long term behavior or you know whatever activities and which tools do you use? So we're not providing an answer here. What we're trying to pr pr provide is a uh, system wide framework for us to make decisions that make sense uh, in any given circumstance and across colleges because it varies. And let me give you the best example I can give you. At Tidewater, if you get promoted, there's like uh, three factors used if you're assistant professor to associate, associate to full, or instructor to assistant, and there's a range. And that's fairly robust compared to some other colleges that do the minimum by policy, which is $500. I will, I will certainly say I think it's a little bit embarrassing for an organization of our size to say to a faculty member, to get promoted, you have to go back to graduate school and get 18 hours of credit, work for five years, and then we give you $500, right? It's just, that's a, that's a problem there, right? So our philosophy and approach about being miserly, you know, uh, on compensation, I think it's gone a little too far, right? And we need to rethink how and why we do things, and that's what that task force was, is charged with, to investigate the ideas, our belief systems, and then we'll marry that up with the compensation tools to get what we intend. So, you know, it's kind of a long-winded response to that, but that's what we're trying to do is to say what, what and why do we do that? Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. All right. Now, what I'm going to be showing you here is uh, it's three or four slides um, 
of different philosophies. I'm not saying that you have to sit here and read them all thoroughly, okay? But what I want to point out are some commonalities among these philosophies. And again, this is what we're shooting for, okay, is a compensation philosophy that is going to work for us. Um, but if you notice um, on the second bullet, you're going to see this again throughout um, all of these uh, statements, attracting, retaining, rewarding. So in other words, what we're trying to do is the same thing. So we feel like we're, we're right in line with where we need to be with our reasoning for why we need to put a compensation philosophy in writing. Okay. Um, on the second one, that this one is, uh, the first one was uh, George Washington University. This is Princeton University. Um, number one, attract a qualified, diverse workforce. Retain and motivate. Right. These are their objectives. Um, the next one, Chris, if you would. Uh, this one is Intel. Okay, it's not a university, but it's Intel. But if you look down on the bulleted items, you'll see motivate employees, balance performance, recruit and retain the highest caliber of employees. And then last, we have one by Guardian. And at Guardian, um, they're looking to compensate for performance. Okay. Um, they're looking to do the same thing that we're trying to do. All right, attract, retain, and motivate our employees. Now, a lot of you know the rewards recognition. We have policies, we have programs in place, but we're not using them consistently. Um, we need to get there. And so we feel like a compensation philosophy, by putting it in writing, is going to help us. And it will provide direction uh, to all colleges in order to provide compensation, whatever form it may be in, um, in, in some kind of a reward, a bonus, an increase, um, that we have that consistency among all of the colleges. And as Chris was mentioning with the bonus or with the uh, promotions, I totally agree with him. Um, we spend a lot of money to get a degree, and a $500 increase to your base salary doesn't do a whole lot to motivate you. So we do need to do something around that. Okay, that's all I have. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, I'll, I'll echo. If you see on this particular example here, they, they talk about their company and their belief system here. And then it says, hey, we're looking for people who embody an entrepreneurial spirit. And if you're willing to chase, uh, face challenges head on, turn innovative ideas into results and learn from your mistakes, you you can have what it takes you know, uh, you know, to work for them. So that's kind of the idea. But they're putting their, their belief system into practice, right? And that's what the philosophy is designed to do. So that's a good segue as we start talking about uh, performance evaluations, uh, the faculty evaluation process that we've just gone through. It, they have some elements of a compensation philosophy in it, right? So you can see some connection in our kind of human capital strategy. So from the preamble that you know went into the model plan, it talks about the idea of investing, right? That we want to invest in faculty. So the old process was about pure old school evaluation, a rating system, one through five sort of idea. And if you notice, our new system is completely different uh, in focus. That it has three legs. Certainly, you got the traditional evaluation, but it has the annual goals and kind of continuous performance improvement sort of thing, which is really the bedrock idea in the new system. And then it's a reward and recognition component, so a three-legged stool, but the idea is about continuous learning, and it's about improvement. It talks about setting high standards, challenging goals, and excellence. So these are new ideas, and we hope to build our systems around the things that we aim uh, to do, continuous improvement and learning. Uh, we want to foster a culture of high, you know, uh, high performance, excellence, Professional development keeps, you know, going, you know, uh, uh, being woven through the ideas here in our new evaluation system. Uh, mutually reinforcing goals of learning and reward, using evidence to make decisions, and then this is a compensation philosophy statement 
in and of itself. It says that achievement should be recognized and exemplary performance should be rewarded. That's a fundamental shift in how we think about compensation for faculty, right? So those are uh, some examples of these things uh, coming to fruition. So those are a couple, uh, three quick slides on evaluations. Questions or thoughts about that, and then we'll shift to another initiative. Dr. Yes, ma'am. This is primarily dealing with faculty. However, the philosophies and all that you all have said before has been um, encompassing everyone. Is there another aspect you want to share for the classified? Or well, we, we haven't gotten the classified yet. We're starting that path. So okay. if you remember how our system operates, the state board governs faculty, right? You know, classified is governed by the Department of HR Management. So we, are, we, are, we, we have to follow their rules. But having a compensation philosophy allows us then to use those tools in a different way. Right, so we have the policies right now, but as we said, we don't have a practice of using some of the tools they have consistently, you know, in the way we could use them. And so our philosophy gives us kind of a driving direction. And so we're moving in exactly that direction. We're building the blocks one at a time. Absolutely. So wouldn't it be nice to have kind of an approach that says that learning for staff is just as important as it is for faculty, that we build systems uh, to help people move. And so, for example, you know, just, you know, I'm not making policy standing here as an HR person, but what if we had systems to say, why aren't we trying to help some classified staff become teaching faculty through learning, particularly if you're in a small town and it's hard to find physicists, you know, in Withville, I'm going to assume, right, you know? <laughs> and so the point is that wouldn't it be great if you had somebody on staff with potential that we could cultivate? But what we haven't done is linked our policies to create some of the outcomes we want, and we're trying to be more deliberate in doing so. Okay. All right, so one of the major initiatives we have this year is a chancellor's goal on diversity and inclusion. So, you know, we're having a task force, and we have a lot of, we've had a lot of meetings. We're getting ready to produce a report in the next 30 or so days. Uh, it's due to the state board in July. It'll hit ACOP in June. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about diversity writ large. A lot of times people think about diversity as just those things you can see, but there are a lot of dimensions that make up a person. And so we're talking about what that means. Here's what the experts say about diversity. First, you're talking about a for-profit environment. They're saying diversity produces better outcomes for organizations in many different ways. You know, they say that, you know, you, know, you have better sales, you make better decisions about your products, you have, you know, you make fewer mistakes because you've got a, a wider perspective. Uh, it's better for, you know, retention of employees and fewer lawsuits and, you, you know, create better products, a lot of great ideas. And then there's some compendium uh, ideas that related to student success as well. The diversity has an educational component. And I have uh, Jackie Spiker, who's the uh, HR officer for Paul DeCamp uh, Community College. She's on that task force. I don't think anybody else, so please chime in, Jackie, if you have any comments as we go forward. So here's uh, some research that says that students uh, learn better, right? There's greater, greater student outcomes when there's a diverse perspective. And there's certainly an argument can be made that diversity is really one of the bedrock principles of a Jeffersonian sort of education, right? The idea that you go away and you learn is broad liberal ideas and it comes from multiple different perspectives, cultures, environments, that that's really what an education is all about. Here's another example. They're saying having a multicultural curriculum produces better outcomes as well. You know, a particular study uh, in the uh, uh, medical profession that curricular changes improves performance for all students, uh, majority and underrepresented. Uh, and before we go forward, as actually uh, heard on NPR last week, something that should cause us to think as academics, uh, a, a lot of the professors know that one of the the ways you find out a university professor has had an impact on their profession, you use that index, I can't say the Fleischer or something index or whatever, the number of times that their uh, journal articles have been cited by others is one of the, the largest measures of professional impact. And what they found in a study was that <coughs> when uh, there were multiple authors and they all had the same kind of ethnic surnames, whether they were English or Chinese, that they were cited less than articles that appeared to have multiple ethnic, uh, you know, uh, surnames uh, and the authors. That's kind of a big deal. And so the articles are positing, I mean, the authors are positing that diversity produces greater diversity of thought and perspective, and that produces a higher quality research. I mean, that's pretty groundbreaking if you're thinking about sort of a research uh, sort of a uh, activity. 
So why is this stuff important to us? And in addition to the idea that inherently there's some value in the perspective. It's about access. And we got this whole idea of serving students and serving underrepresented students. And so the question is, are we serving Virginia the way Virginia is and is and is becoming? And this was very interesting from last month's uh, Richmond Times Dispatch that said in in 1970, only one in a hundred Virginians were foreign born. And today it's one in nine. Most of those are in Northern Virginia, but you know how migration works, right? You know, so this will affect us all more and more e each day. Are we prepared to educate tomorrow's students? Here's some members of the task force. Uh, Dr. Dever from Thomas Nelson's leading that group. Dr. I mean, Miss uh, uh, Dorcas Helfand Browning on our state board. She's co-chairing, and we have a number of representatives from across the state. Here's a kind of a draft that uh, of the educational case for diversity the group has, and, and they're arguing that diversity uh, and inclusive environments is a part of our mission. I mean, because we say after all, we give everyone right an opportunity, and we're shifting that from just opportunity to you know just not access but success. Uh, that you know it's uh, helps employees as well. People want to feel like they are a part of the team that what they do matters and that it can contribute at a high level. It impacts student success. Students learn better in a, in a diverse and inclusive environment. And students is also educational. That students need to be able to live and operate in a multicultural world. And this is not a Northern Virginia and a Tidewater sort of thing. It's a Southwest and a Withville perspective because while the population might not be as diverse visually, I mean, you know, I've heard the story that you might be in Southwest, but you work for a French company. And I think you need to have a cultural orientation if you want to advance in that organization who has a slightly different perspective. If you're in South Side, then you might work, be working for IKEA. You know, so they have a different perspective because you know, obviously they're they're European as well. So the idea that we are we educating students to work in a multicultural world. And here's from a chancellor speech. Chancellor did a speech for uh, the University System of Nevada, uh, and he was talking about diversity. And here's so some of the things he said. Serving Virginia's 21st century students, helping them succeed, requires Virginia's community college to construct a faculty and staff that embraces uh, the diversity of our communities and fosters a spirit and practice of inclusivity. In our efforts to achieve that, we have discovered and affirmed three guiding principles. First, our business case determines our faculty and staff diversity, meaning that we want to look like our students, right? Second, we must focus not just on diversity, but also inclusion. It's not just enough to have a diverse looking collection of people in the room. They must also be in the conversation and in the decision making process. And then third, finding and fostering inclusion is a leadership competency that must permeate our organization. It's not enough for the guy at the top to embrace no matter how hard he tries. It must be broader. And what he's saying is, what the experts are saying, that diversity is a leadership competency. And it doesn't matter, doesn't matter what the diversity dimension is, that if you're dealing with a bunch of baseball players, right, that you want, you don't want four, you know, four shortstops. You want one good shortstop and a first baseman and an outfielder, right, whether it's race, gender, age, region, uh, discipline, uh, perspective of any type, that a leadership challenge is forming a team that works best across any dimension. And that's a leadership competency. It's not about how a person looks, it's what they bring to the table and how do you manage all that. And so that's a part of the perspective that we'll be carrying forward. And then finally, he speaks to the idea of diversity from a URP perspective, underrepresented population. And as he said it, uh, here, the truth is that many of those URP students, even if you can get them in the door in the first place, don't feel like they belong in college. That's the inclusion part. As educators, part of our job is to convince them that they belong. We can't do that if we can't connect with them. I liken that to speaking the same language. So socioeconomics is a good example. We've got a lot of middle class people in this room, right? A lot of our students aren't middle class. So do, do the teachers, do the faculty, administrators have a perspective that can relate to that student who just cobbled together enough dollars to make it to class, and then they found out they got a $400 book purchase to make, right? Or they can't make it to class because of some family situation. Are we prepared? Do we have the cultural competence to educate that student 
whether they're in Richmond or Tidewater or Appalachia. The idea that socioeconomic is another diversity factor that's on our URP list, right? First generation pale, you know, et cetera, et cetera, geography, income, all that sort of thing. These things matter. And then the chancellor echoes and finishes and says, in fact, in fact, when I first attended a community college, I was a URP. I was the first in my family to pursue a higher education. I know how important this is to our students. So diversity comes in many forms. It's a leadership competency. It's our student population. And how are we prepared to get us there? So one of the things we're talking about as a diversity task force is cultural competency. Can we operate across a spectrum to meet our students where they are to take them to where they need to be. Jackie, do you have anything you would add? I know at Paul DeCamp we're currently hiring five new faculty and I've stressed to the search committees when I go in to do my EEO speech that we do need to value diversity and I do keep an eye on the search pools to make sure we have diverse candidates and that's how your HR department can help you with that. They can take a look at your EEO stats for your pools, making sure that you have enough minority candidates um, in your pools to make sure that you can hire those good candidates. Yes, ma'am. Definitely. I, I see a greater need. Um, I'm from Tidewater, and I work with training and development as a human resource manager. Um, these initiatives are great, and that's exactly what we need. It's going to take a cultural mindset shift in order to make some of these things happen. Because as we look into our needs for our students and what we are going to be facing as our populations become more diverse, yep. we really have to do a lot with training and professional development. And of course, I stand on that because that's yeah. my, my, yeah. my bias and my love. But I see such a great need because some people don't realize that diversity is outside of those things that we can see. Absolutely. Um, and those other aspects that will bring quality to the teaching and into the connection with our students. There is such a great need. And I, and I can appreciate our professional development initiatives as we go forward being more um, open to diversity and what diversity really is and how it's going to impact our students. Yes, well, you will, you will enjoy um, uh, some of the work that will come out of the task force because it will speak to the need for professional development and kind of a cultural shift, right? So a lot of these initiatives are obviously broad-based and will take years to bring to fruition, but it takes, you know, the education first before you change the actions, right? So uh, we're, we're on that path. All right, so we're going to press ahead. We have a couple other things to talk about. So, you know, uh, just a quick few quick commercials on some of the other things we're doing from an HR perspective to support this idea of investing in our faculty and staff, helping people to get better, right? So uh, there's an administrative efficiency study going, going right now, and Karen's going to talk about one of, the, one of the things that was kind of going in parallel with that from an HR perspective. There's a bench, big benchmarking study going across our colleges, looking at how we do business, not only in HR, but in all of administrative services, whether it's procurement, uh, IT, uh, student services, uh, accounts payable, and finance. So a lot of things going on there. HR, we were a little bit ahead of that group. We've been you know, studying ourselves for the past 14 months, and we have an HR strategy and some elements that are coming about. Karen's going to share that in a moment. But we're also doing lots of things with adjuncts. So next hour, we got a you know, topic on uh, adjuncts that uh, Ms. Grennan and I are talking about because, as you as you know, they're our largest population. They teach half of our student you know credit hours. Very important to us to invest in our adjunct population because we we really think that's the biggest student success initiative for the coming years. I mean, from my perspective, because affecting that population, getting them better, will really impact a lot of students. And then some other things. We have a leadership development program uh, that uh, in its infancy. Uh, Ms. Stone Rock, who's head of the Office of Professional Development, she and I are working with the Chancellor on that. You'll hear about that this spring. We're going to have a leadership academy. Uh, we have a knowledge management framework coming, and that basically says, how does the VCCS share its professional competencies? We know that we've got 23 colleges, and some colleges do this in an excellent manner, but they're okay on something else. And this college does a great job on this and they're okay on something else. How do we institutionalize our best practices? And so you'll hear about that coming soon. And then a few other things. I won't spend time on all the details here, but just to let you know, there's a whole lot of things going on in this human capital strategy area. Uh, and part of that engine, we're going to argue, is from an HR department 
and Ms. Foreman is going to conclude with those remarks. Thank you. Um, HR strategy is something um, that we started working on last summer. Was last summer, Susan? Um, real excited about this and excited to be on the committee. It's the HR um, Transform Strategy and Transformation Group, also known as HERST. A lot easier to say. <laughs> okay. um, so our charge was to uh, plan, develop, and recommend strategies um, that were going to help us to do our jobs better and improve processes, okay, and to move into more of a strategic area um, with our work. What I'm showing up here is a model on the left-hand side of what a traditional HR model looks like for a lot of organizations uh, today. And if you notice on this one on the left, 60% of work in HR is administrative. All right. We want to change that. We want to move over to the right-hand side, and we want that 60% to become that business partnering, partnering uh, piece, where it's more strategic, um, allows us to tap um, into the skills that we have on many of our HR folks uh, instead of working on transactions, um, we have them working in more strategic roles. Okay, Chris. Um, this is, um, for the most part, there's a couple extra faces here, but this is the group uh, that makes up the uh, Hearst group. Um, been a very dedicated group, uh, working very hard together uh, to make this plan come together. Uh, I am proud to be a part of it. All right, two more models up here. The one on the, the left, um, again, it's, it's, it's basically showing you what is going on um, in HR. All right, again, if you look at that, you can see it's administrative work. We want to move over to the right. This is where we're going. All right. It is going to, again, be more strategic aligned with what we are trying to accomplish as an HR group. It's going to be a complete transformation of HR. We want to standardize, automate, and integrate. Okay, that's going to be important to us to get to where we want to go. Here are three, uh, three areas that we have already come up with. I do need to use my notes on this, forgive me. Uh, number one, transforming the HR organizational structure, function, and the work, role, uh, work roles. I'm sorry. Um, this is an area where we have to we have to change the structure of HR in order to be able to do this. We want to be able to reduce duplication of efforts. Right? 23 colleges doing the same things. All right, what can we do to in, improve those processes? Um, Developing and implementing strategic HR functions, and that was on actually on one of the models that we showed you on a previous slide. Training and development, or training and organizational development, is an area we want to move into. Executive recruitment, okay, talent management, and benefits and total rewards. Number two, enhancing the use of technology to replace our current technology platform. I think you're going to find this information interesting. Um, when we were working on this and looking at technology and what we're using in the HR area, there are six separate systems that we use just to perform HR and payroll transactions. We have HRMS, PEMAS, SIPS, BEST, PayLine, and eDirect. And then on top of that, we have more than two dozen additional technologies that are used within the 23 different colleges. That's a lot of application or a lot of technology that we're using. And we need to do a better job of pulling this back and being able to put a platform in place that is going to work more efficiently for us and get everybody basically on the same page. Um, one of the things that I would like to mention to you, and I certainly don't want to steal any of Susan's thunder for her next presentation, um, but one of the things that we did um, to help at Lord Fairfax Community College was to look at a cloud-based software program that is made by Silk Road called Red Carpet. 
And what we were using what we're using this for is now new hire orientations. Uh, it has uh, it has been phenomenal for us. Um, we now instead of spending two to three hours and sitting down and processing a new employee on their first day or first week of work, um, and also sending out packets of information. Um, I don't know how many trees we've killed, but it's been a lot, all right, with just all the paperwork that has to be pulled together and sent out and filled out by the new hire and then trying to get all that paperwork back. Uh, we've eliminated all of that. Red Carpet has basically taken that process and it's all online. Everything's on a portal. The new hire goes in, fills out all their paperwork. It's got electronic signatures. No more signing of paperwork. No more filing of paperwork. All right. So it has saved us a tremendous amount of time. So basically, your new employee, when they come to work on their first day, they are day one ready. Okay, ready to be productive. And on top of that, the red carpet also allows you to put a lot of other information out there about the college. Um, policies, procedures, and so forth. And the employee can still go out there after they've come on board as a new employee and go back and review information and look at benefits and so forth. And it actually allows you to put all of your employees into the system to allow them to do the same thing. So it's been a, it's been a great advancement for us. And number three, implement a shared service center model. You know, I mentioned a while ago, 23 colleges doing duplication of efforts, doing the same thing. So we're looking at shared services, OK? Um, the shared services could be where one college is performing one activity, another college is performing another, um, as opposed to all of us doing the same thing all the time over and over again, OK? All of this is in planning right now. So I'm not going to get into any details with you on it, but I just wanted you to know um, that this is the, the road that we're going down. And we're all pretty excited about it. Um, and hopefully we'll have more to share with you soon. OK, as we conclude here, I'll just echo on the shared services side. We have to ask ourselves some fundamental questions, such as do we need 23 payroll departments? We have to, actually we have 24 payroll departments. Not many organizations our size duplicate that effort across organizations. Same for travel. Many corporations do that sort of thing using, uh, you know, scan technologies and things like that. So we're asking fundamental questions, all designed to ensure that we're investing our resources in the right sort of activities on, you know, on behalf of everyone. All right. So today, what we talked about was a kind of a, a human capital framework. The idea that we spend 700 plus million dollars a year on personnel services. We need a plan to use that those resources wisely, support people the right kind of way. We gave you several examples of the activities that we're doing. You know, the compensation philosophy task force designed to give us an operating framework. Uh, looking at evaluations for faculty. We'll be talking about administrative. Uh, 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 faculty uh, this fall with uh, a task force doing that. Diversity was another one of our initiatives. And then we gave you a, a snapshot look at a few other uh, strategic initiatives that we're up to. All of this is wrapped around this idea that the engine that we think that will drive a lot of this is having a, a, a more effective and strategic HR department. It's working together, but all of it is designed for just one purpose. The idea of utilizing the talent we have within the system to the best possible, uh, uh, with, uh, to the best possible uh, uh, best possible way, utilizing all kinds of employee support systems that are generated from the HR uh, sort of environment. So that's our presentation. We'll open it up for questions in the last few minutes that we have available. Or suggestions. We're open for good ideas. Yes, sir. Dr. Lee, I think you went back to uh, the Guardian philosophy slide uh, that spoke to what their compensation and human resources philosophy was. It was really encapsulated in that one sentence that talked about employees bringing value and being appropriately compensated. Yes. That says it all. Uh, you, you really don't need to say we're going to recruit and retain. Once you've got someone in place, it's that value then that's compensated. And I guess you could infer from that the value then transfers back to the employee because of the compensation Absolutely. and the all the other yeah. intangibles. Agreed. Agreed. And what we have to do is get to that point of articulating what our what our value is. You know what what, what our values are rather. You know what do we believe and how we approach it. In the past, it's been seed time. You know, just wait around. 
Is that the way of the future? Does that make sense for today's world? And I think a lot of people are challenging that. And as an example, as a learning institution, should learning be it? Right? When we talk about investing in faculty and, and continuous improvement, should learning be one of the bedrock principles that we're a learning community, that we live what we preach? Right? You know what I'm saying? That everybody's trying to learn, that every staff member should get a professional certification in their discipline, in their profession. Right, you know, every faculty member should, you know, get continuous, you know, improvement in their discipline. So I think those ideas are the things that we're exploring. I saw a hand somewhere. Okay. I know a lot of colleges are moving to more and more adjuncts rather than full time. Yes. But has there been consideration that sometimes really investing in the full time employees as well, like hiring maybe more, to give them more opportunities to really have the student success? Yes. Well, that's uh, that's a great question. I'm gonna punt on that one. So you got to come to next hour, and in the, in the, in the adjunct section, uh, session, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. But you're absolutely right. We we have to look at that, and some of that is economic. You know that we don't have much control over, but we do have some control over that. You know, and how we're funded and that sort of thing. But next hour, we will go into that in a greater, a little greater detail. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Um. There's there's I'm a full-time math faculty yep. and. There is this sense that it's administration versus faculty, and I feel personally that the faculty on my college, anyway, there's there's not a level of disrespect, of of just plain respect for faculty, and that's free. You know, just respecting people who who have gone to school and have a master's degree in mathematics, who've been teaching for 15, 20 years, and then we're treated like we're kind of um, a, a, a un unimportant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to the point where uh, we, I, I, um, I don't mean to be sound so nasty, <laughs> but I, I just simply asked for extra black felt pens, and I was told, well, that's an ex that's a that's a special expense, and we don't have money for that, and you'll have to go through round and round yep. just to get basic office supplies. It is it has become so toxic in our departmental office that we avoid the office. You know, just a simple level of respect for the faculty who have been there for a long time would go a long way toward wanting to improve, wanting to do things, and I don't see it where I work, and I'm well, not alone. Well, you know, I, I agree with you 100%, and that's why we're, we're having this conversation. We need to work on our culture, our environment, our goals, and it, this is a time to reset and rethink about doing things a little better. So, you know, I, I always say, well, you know, you, you got to help now. You brought it up, so we're going to engage you in that process. And that's why we're here having the conversation that we all have to work together to create the environment that we, we would like to have. All right? So I'll, I'll be calling you. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Well, I just want to piggyback on what she was saying. And I think with the with adjuncts or with myself, it kind of starts at the top with leadership. And I think a lot of people have in mind that adjuncts, okay, they work another job and this is maybe just a part-time job for them. And I know for my situation it's a little different because I'm working on my doctorate and the times is kind of flexible and I'm there along with the full-time person kind of sharing the load. So I think if it just trickles down and, and we're just looked at as, well, maybe they don't want to go to that professional development or maybe they wouldn't be interested and they're just here and it's just a second job or whatever. Well, some of us are vested in what we do. I mean, we're vested in the college, we're vested in the students, and sometimes they come to us more than they do the full-time person because they sometimes maybe see us more or we were in a capacity before that and then another person came on board or what have you. But I, I do think that, yes, we, we make a big force of the workload at the college, but if there are some maybe other avenues that are maybe open up for us, we'll be just as effective as well. But it kind of trickles down. If we're not looked at as we're very important, even though we're crucial and it's I'm thinking they don't want to go. Well, you don't know. Provide us training. You know, give us the opportunity. Every time I come here, I learn so much to take back. And it's just amazing how there's other colleagues, just like I'm texting one right now, where are you? And I'm thinking, well, I'm at New Horizons. Well, they teach at TCC too, and they're clueless, and there's emails and things that go out. But you have to just be proactive as well. So I think as if we're not proactive to let the leaders know that we're interested, and sometimes maybe they're they're not aware, but it does kind of trickle down from how we're treated. Well, if you're just treated like maybe a, a second class citizen, then you know you're going to feel like that. So you've got to be kind of proactive yourself. Yes. 
<laughs> well, everyone's echoing the challenges and opportunities that we have before us. Please come to the next hour. This is my third commercial. I won't, I won't, I won't do any more set promotion. We're going to be talking about our adjunct support initiative because, as you point out, adjuncts are our largest uh, employee population, and it really, really matters. All right. So thank you all for uh, you know coming and sharing the hour with us. If you have ideas or suggestions, you, you want to be on one of these groups, task forces, and participate in the process of making us all better, please let us know. All right. Thank you. Oh, you up here.